With Isekai Quartet Season 3 being announced, I can only imagine what other Isekai they'll end up bringing into the fold. Even the overly cautious hero made his unexpected debut towards the end of Season 2. But with every new series they add comes more opportunities to showcase the deeper lore for each of them. I mean, where else can you find a complete list of every single one of Reinhardt's powers? So let's once again overanalyze this non-canon comedic storyline for any and all of the little easter eggs and references that the creators like to put into every episode, a lot of which are references to the source material, which if you want to read for yourself you can do so via Bookwalker. As I mentioned a little while back, Bookwalker and I have partnered together, and considering that their platform carries the English translated digital light novels and manga for literally every Isekai Quartet series, it would be a missed opportunity to not shout them out right now. I mean, if you've ever wanted to read up on Overlord, Konosuba, ReZero, or Yojo Senki, then Bookwalker is the best place to find out what happens next. It's where I get all this information from. So, if you're new to Bookwalker and want to read more into the original stories, then you can use the link in the description and code Annie News to get $5 off your first ebook purchase today. It's honestly a great way to support not only the industry, but also my channel as well. So, feel free to use that link and catch up on all of the isekais. Now, let's get to the easter eggs. In episode 6, there's a bit that could be said about the teams that were formed. Most characters are grouped in a way that best suits who they are. And as Beatrice said, the whole thing was more than likely rigged by Roswell, especially with Amelia being chosen as the class representative. I mean, I can see how Roswell wants her in that position in order to give her experience with leading others. Moving on to the teams, Aura's placement into animal care is most definitely attributed to her build as a ranger and a beast tamer, while Subaru doesn't seem all that bad with animals himself based on his bond with his earth dragon. For the disciplinary team, Kazuma does seem like the odd one out, but if you really think about it, he is usually the one to keep his party members in line. So, in a way, though it's not on the same scale as Demiurge's demon armies or Tanya's Imperial 203rd Aerial Mage Battalion, he still leads and manages a group of people, which seems to be the common element for the three of them. For lunch, we know that Ram, as a maid, does have experience doing that type of service work at the Roswell Mansion, and Visha just loves everything and anything related to food. Then Beatrice and Mare being part of the library team come as no surprise either. Beatrice is the caretaker and guardian of Roswell's personal library of spellbooks, while Mare is known to be quite fond of reading books from Nazareth's library, Ashurbanipal. As for the nurses, both Rem and Shaltir have healing spells that can be used on others. People of the Undead variant can be treated by Shaltir's negative energy-based healing spells, while normal people can be healed via Rem's water magic. And finally, the other teams of Jim and Intercom are more suited to each person's personality. Other than that, there was a reference to a recurring element in the Konosuba series. At the end of Season 1, and at various points throughout the light novels, we are given Cosmos' perspective on things through a written letter to his parents, sort of like an inner monologue on how he views current affairs. And that's something that we're given midway through this episode while he's being disciplined by Tanya and Demiurge. It's during this that Demiurge also makes a comment about the world's power balance. You see, he attempted to use his command mantra skill on Tanya and Kazuma, a passive skill that turns his words into absolute orders. Weak-minded individuals and those under level 40 will always submit to its effects. Which means that in the scale of Overlord levels, Tanya is at least over level 40 and is very strong-willed. In episode 7, the spotlight definitely shines on the characters from ReZero. Amelia is pretty happy to be in a world where everyone is so accepting of her. Beatrice is able to make a friend, which is pretty rare considering her innate stubbornness and inability to deal with other people. Naturally, she is a lonely spirit, but that doesn't mean that she's unwilling to get along with others. So, it makes sense that the quiet and passive nature of Mare would resonate easily with her. Then, two peculiar things happened with Subaru. The first was with Hemske. For some reason, she couldn't stop herself from trying to eat Subaru. But as we'll find out later, Subaru's curse bears the scent of the witch, which, as we know, induces hostility within magical beasts. So it's likely that Humske picked up on this scent and fell victim to her primal urges. The second event was when Ainz finally detected the presence of the curse itself. Now, whether he has the ability to remove the curse or not, well, I'm not sure. But clearly it was something that he wanted no part of. Or at least not right now anyway. Moving on to episode 8, there's a scene where Puck points out that it was time to go home. Based on the time of the clock, it was 5pm, 
which is around the same time that Puck usually has to return to her crystal. If you remember from episode 1 of Free Zero, her typical working hours are from 9 to 5. Anything outside of that requires too much mana to maintain her physical form. Shortly after, when Amelia is verifying that everyone is okay with the event, if you pay close attention to Tanya and her group, you'll notice that everyone waits for Tanya to make a decision before following up immediately after. It's a very small detail, but it nicely shows that no person under Tanya would try to make their own decisions at the risk of contradicting the majors. A little bit later, Kazuma's overreaction to Albedo being a succubus is attributed to his experience at Hell's Door back in Episode 9. I mean, he pretty much made the same face in both anime. The dream thing that he was referring to in this scene was the erotic dream service that the succubi from his world provided. Though that turned out to be a short-lived fantasy because Kazuma soon finds out that Albedo is still a virgin, a fact we only find out in Season 2 of Overlord. In the next episode, Kazuma uses his lurk skill to mildly conceal his presence. But of course something as low level as that wouldn't work on a floor guardian like Demiurge. It's also implied that Tanya was the one that spotted him, so clearly Lurk doesn't work on her either. Now, throughout this episode, even though Shaltir is seen to be staying in the shader under her umbrella, the sun actually doesn't have much of an effect on her at all. Yeah, she is a vampire, but vampires in the game Yggdrasil, when under the sun, only received a minor movement penalty. And because Shaltir is level 100, such a movement penalty becomes degraded to the point that it's barely noticeable. Later on, we see Kazuma use his steel skill to capture the flag. Then, during the group setup for the Test of Courage, Beatrice references her age to Lieutenant Grants. She's much older than him because she's a spirit that was born around 400 years ago. Now, towards the end, we get to the big reveal that all our protagonists are from the same Earth. Although it may be surprising that Aqua was the one to figure it out, it does make a bit of sense, since she is a goddess that has experienced isekai numerous people from Japan to the world of Konosuba. She was, by all means, a goddess that oversaw the people of Japan. The subsequent rage from Tanya was enough magical energy to traumatize Newman and Grants from a distance. But what's more interesting is that Tanya was able to instantly enable magic that was stronger than the 8th tier. This puts her above level 55 in terms of Overlord scaling, so slowly we're getting a better picture as to how Tanya scales in power in comparison to the others. So far she's already shown that she's more powerful than half of the battle mates. But if you consider that Tanya's full potential can only be unlocked by praying to Sonzai X, then I wouldn't be surprised if her magic could reach the 9th or 10th tier levels. I mean, although the Yojo Senki anime downplayed it a lot, Tanya can pretty much reproduce a tactical nuke if she decided to go all out with her Type 95 relic. Episode 10 introduces us to the whole cast of support characters, and in their class there's a note on the chalkboard dictating the absence of Tweet Nika Teyanen a soldier from Tanya's squadron that was honorably discharged after eating a rotten potato. There's actually a post credit scene from episode 9 where Tanya is seen writing to the Tainan family over Tweet's humiliating release. Now, probably my favorite scene for the entire episode was when Subaru gave that lengthy overview as to how overpowered Reinhardt was. If we take Subaru for his word, the following list is everything that Reinhardt possesses. Clearly there's quite a few. But some of the notable ones are things like his first attack and preceding attack immunity, which pretty much makes every single attack directed at him miss. There's his numerous blessings that allow him to gain power in pretty much every single environment. Then resistances that reduce all types of effects and damages by 80%. He can never be ambushed and also never miss with a projectile. He gains complete mastery over any item he holds regardless of whether it's a weapon or not, making him quite proficient at cooking and crafting as well. Then there's his Jesus level abilities like mind reading, water walking, cloud walking, and even total immunity to all diseases and poisons. And even on top of all of that, should something somehow get the best of him and cause him to die, his blessing of the phoenix will grant him one chance to come back to life. But out of all of these, I think the most OP skill he possesses is the ability to never get salt and sugar mixed up. That's pretty insane. Now, I'm not entirely sure that every single one of these is canon but I'm pretty sure that most of it, if not all of it, is in fact true. And if that is the case, then maybe we might actually have someone who is more overpowered than Ainz. That would be a 1v1 I wouldn't mind seeing. The next easter egg is a pretty big spoiler for Konosuba, so if you don't want to know what it is, then feel free to skip ahead to the timestamp on the screen. We good? Okay, so when Chris and the others are having their conversation in the hallway, Chris becomes quite visibly nervous when the topic of Eris comes up. 
This is because we find out in volume 8 of the light novels that Chris is actually heiress in disguise. It's her adventurer alias when she's not doing her heavenly duties. This is hinted pretty heavily again in episode 11, but unless you already suspect that she's heiress, it's not something that you'd piece together right away. In the next scene, another small detail is that Shaltair is seen drinking a glass of blood instead of the tea that Rem and Almedo have. Then, after this, Subaru confirms that his return by death curse is still active, and the scent of the witch is revealed to work on undead as well. Back in the classroom, Tanya's subordinates whip out shovels that refer back to their time in training. The shovel is quite an important tool in the anime. To Tanya, it's one of the most essential items for any soldier to have in their arsenal. Its versatility as both a weapon and a utility tool are unrivaled, and Tanya likes to beat that fact into her squadron's head by making them realize its full potential through rigorous training. So, what Kazuma should have been doing during this makeshift artillery strike was digging holes and hiding in them, much like how Visha did back during her winter training. In episode 11, Eins refers to the combat mates as his shield. This is because before Nazrik was transported to the New World, the mates existed as the last line of defense against invaders. Should a guild raid the tomb and somehow make their way through each of the ten floors, then the Pleiades would be nothing more than a minor inconvenience to them. Their purpose was to simply buy Ayn's time to prepare for the inevitable final battle. After all, the Pleiades are highly underleveled in comparison to the Floor Guardians, so any group of people who could surmount the first nine floors would have no problem taking on a group of maids who aren't even level 100. As the field day begins, the first notable scene comes from Yuri Alpha. Here she takes advantage of her Dullahan race to literally remove her head and reach the apple. She can do this because Dullahans are a type of undead whose corpse has no head. Typically, they carry their heads around, but they also have the ability to reconnect it to their body via something like a ribbon or a collar. Next, we see that Reinhard was able to best Cocutus in a battle of strength. This is no small feat, especially when you consider that Cocutus is one of the physically strongest denizens of Nazarek. Now, the cavalry battle showcases a lot of abilities. Eins opens up with the 7th tier spell, Greater Teleportation, to which Pandora's actor responds by doing the same, using his main doppelganger trait to replicate Eins' appearance and his abilities. You see, doppelgangers in Overlord are able to use the skills and abilities of the person they've changed into with up to 80% potency. It's limited to a maximum of 45 forms, but Eins and the other 40 guild members are within that subset. Towards the end, we see Julius use a new spell that isn't mentioned in the novels. El Clausevia is likely a defensive variant to his spirit magic. Normally, Julius would use his spirits to imbue his sword with energy, but here he uses them to create some form of magical barrier. Chris then uses the skill Bind, which deploys a rope to snare the target. The rope is also infused with mana, which makes it harder to cut or untie. The more mana infused, the harder it is to break free. In the final episode, we get to see a few more abilities, but a lot of them are fairly self-explanatory. Roswell uses his uniquely styled rainbow-colored magic attacks, something that's only possible due to his magical affinity to all six of the elements. It's an extremely rare trait that very few mages in the world of ReZero possess. The specific attack he used here was Spectral Flames, fireball projectiles of different colors that can penetrate other magic. Then, later we see Eins use the 10th tier spell, Body of a Fulgent Barrel, a spell that basically nullifies the effects of any bludgeoning type attack, making destroyers push ineffective against them. Undeath Army is the 7th tier spell we see Ainz use after to summon the hordes of skeletons. Kazuma using Snipe and Steel are skills whose success is based off of his luck stat. Typically this stat is abnormally high, but we find out that in the world of Isekai Quartet, his stats have been somewhat altered. Considering that he could still hit his snipes but wasn't able to steal what he was targeting, it's likely that his luck stats are still moderately high, just slightly debuffed a bit. Subaru using the curse to his advantage and Tanya praying to Sanzai X are abilities that I'm sure you're already well aware of. So, other than that, at the end there's one final reference to a central theme in Overlord. Eins doesn't find the current world to be so bad because he feels that the Floor Guardians are gaining a bit of independence. This is something that he's been trying to teach them ever since they gained sentience. It's because Eins has realized that they're too dependent on him and his orders. To him, the Floor Guardians are essentially his children and he feels that it's his responsibility as the last remaining guild member to teach them what he can. They can't be hanging on to his words forever, so that's why Eins wants to teach them to be more independent. But yeah, that's every easter egg or little reference that I could find in the rest of season 1. 
Now, as I said in the beginning, if you want to stay up to date with all the main storylines of the anime and isekai quartet, then Bookwalker is the best place to do just that. It's constantly being updated with the latest official translations of the newest volumes, and it's how I get my information and stay up to date with all my favorite isekais. So feel free to use the link in the description and code Annie News to get $5 off your first ebook purchase today. Now, as always, thank you so much for watching, and if you enjoyed this type of anime content, then you already know what to do. So until next time, ciao!